Hi, I'm Ali Ryan and welcome to all your fertility questions answered with Sims IVF. Today we're going to be chatting to an expert panel answering all your fertility questions from AMH testing to egg freezing. There are also so many common misconceptions when it comes to fertility, so we're going to be busting some serious myths today. Today we're going to be talking to Dr. Moses Botwala from Sims IVF, Thalia Heffernan, and the Director of Nursing and Clinical Services in Sims IVF, Mikey O'Brien and Holly Carpenter. There's a lot of questions to get through. We asked our readers what questions they had, and there were so many different ones, so we'll try and get through the basic questions for a start. So, Mikey, I want to start with you. Let's talk about just the absolute basics. What does it mean to actually be fertile? So Ali, to be fertile um, is really to be able to conceive a child or have a baby. Um, but then there's also the other side of that, to be infertile. Mm -hmm. And for that, I'm going to ask Moses to describe that. <laughs> Thanks, Mikey. Um, uh, the, the clinical definition of infertile is when, and, and it's, some of these terms are kind of... Um, have been in use for a very long time, so uh, they are new, uh, new, new um, explanations. But the, the old definition is, is of infertility is when a heterosexual couple have been trying to conceive for more than 12 months of having regular intercourse and have failed to become pregnant. That is the old definition. But even the term infertile, it's kind of going out of date. And uh, currently, most doctors in the, in, in the current day and age to prefer to use the, uh, the terminology subfertile. And it's really to define that people are having a bit of difficulty getting pregnant. We rarely ever find people who are truly infertile, uh, which means can't, cannot become pregnant. And so we'd say uh, uh, what are defined as people having difficulty getting pregnant is when you've tried to get pregnant for 12 months, that's if you're in a heterosexual relationship and you're having difficulty. Uh, or when you're having regular intercourse. And that's really the definition. And there are so many reasons for this, uh, which, um, uh, 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 which, can, which, uh, which is too, uh, too large to expand on. But that's generally the definition. If you're having 12 months of regular intercourse and you're having difficulty getting pregnant, go and see a doctor. That's good to know, because I think some people feel if they don't get pregnant straight away when they're trying, there must be a problem. But it can actually take up to a year. Yes. So you could technically be fertile. It just doesn't happen straight away. That's very okay. true. Okay. So if it's 12 months and you're in a heterosexual relationship, that's the time to maybe go in and speak to someone. Um, we want to talk about the very first steps today in fertility. So AMH testing. I've got my AMH test. So is Holly today in the panel. What is it? Because I know when I was going in, I didn't know what to expect. Was it a blood test? Was it invasive? But it's actually quite simple, isn't it? Yeah. Um, AMH, it stands for anti-malarian hormone. And it is one of the many tests we have to um, measure the, uh, what I'd, I'd want to call it, the ovarian reserve. Uh, uh, m many people call it the, uh, how fertile a woman is, but it's really the, how ovarian reserve, how many eggs does, uh, does a woman have? It's a quantitative test, meaning it's just looking at uh, quantity of eggs, yeah. not quality. Yeah, okay? which is important. And, yeah. uh, which is a different thing. You can have a low number of eggs, but they're very good quality. Yeah. So you can have a low AMH, but very good quality eggs. For example, if you're 25, 26 years old, and you have a low ovarian reserve, a low AMH, but because of your age, you have very good quality eggs. On the other hand, you could be a woman of advanced age, 48, 49, but you still have good number of eggs, which does happen occasionally. You, there you, you have a good AMH, you have lots of eggs, but because of your age, the quality of those eggs is not as good as when you are in your, tw uh, in your 20s. And okay. that's why egg freezing is important at a younger age, which we'll, we'll get into a little, <laughs> little while. <laughs> yes. um, Mikey, just from your perspective, when someone comes in for an AMH test, I'm sure there's a lot of nerves. Like, you know, what, what would you say to people who maybe want to get tested, but they're very nervous about hearing the news? They don't know what to expect. Yeah, because it's so easy for us to say, oh, it's just a simple blood test. But there's so many people out there that are terrified of even a needle. Um, but what we try to do is hold your hand through the process. So AMH, as Moses said, is anti and hormone. It's a hormone that all women have. Um, normally we would invite you in, we'd do the blood test. The result is normally back within three days. And when we give you the result, it's a number. And we compare that number to your age. 
And there are statistics out there that would say when you're 35, you have half the number of eggs you had when you were 25. And when you're 42, that number has diminished again. So it is really important. And for women, it's really empowering. You know, if I was a woman, I would want to know what my AMH is in my 20s because, you know, we're all so career driven now. Yeah. And I think the ability to have babies, you know, and to plan your future is so important. So to be able to marry those things together, yeah. it's just really important. And we, we hear that expression, knowledge is power. Yeah. And knowing what your AMH is, is going to be, you know, fruitful to yeah. the rest of your life. And that's definitely what we want to kind of front right home with today is that it's just knowing. It's, it is scary because you don't want to get a bad result. Like I'm 32 and I went in and I was so scared it was going to be bad, but now I'm just so glad I've gone in and I'm starting the journey of freezing my eggs. Whereas if I had buried my head in the sand, who knows where I would have been in a couple of years time. So it's really, really important. Dr. Moses, obviously I mentioned there, the sooner the better is how I think of this. Is it, what age would you, I suppose, suggest for someone to go in? It doesn't mean they have to actually freeze their eggs, but to go in and get tested. What would you suggest? Um, you're right. Um, 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 the the younger you are, when you when you uh, when you know what your ovarian reserve is, the better. Um, to, uh, generally speaking, I'd say the best time to, for a, for a woman to check her AMH if she's not um, actively trying to get pregnant is uh, anywhere between 30 to 37 years old. Okay, and the uh, reason why I suggest this is basically women are born with all the eggs they ever have. Okay. That scares me so much. Can I just say, <laughs> when I was told, when I was told that, I went in. It was the first. I was like, oh my god, mm -hmm. they're there, literally the second you're yeah. born. It's, yeah, it's yeah, mad. Yeah. Actually, they, they were formed when you were 16 weeks pregnant in your mom's tummy. Wow. That's when your so eggs. So blame were. her if there's any problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but um, so and literally from when you were 16 weeks pregnant in your mom's tummy, that's when you had the uh, the highest number of eggs you'll ever have. And that was about seven million. Wow. By the time you are born, that number has come down to roughly two, uh, two million. Wow. And then uh, by the time women hit puberty, that number has further decreased to about 500,000 eggs. And from that time, uh, when you start having your periods, depending on your genetics, uh, you can, a woman would, although you release an ovulate and release one egg, actually about anywhere between 100 to 1,000 eggs start that journey with that one egg that eventually gets ovulated and they perish away and disappear in that cycle. Of course, if you're losing about 1,000 eggs a month, you're going to go through your supply much quicker. Yeah. Whereas if you're losing about 100 a month, you go through that supply much, uh, much slower. And once you, have, um, once you have run out of eggs, that's when you hit up the menopause. And the average age of the menopause in the, in, uh, in the in Western Europe is about 50 to 53 years old. Mm -hmm. Now the women who go through their supply slower, they they, they end up going to, into the menopause when they're about uh, uh, late 50s, 60s, uh, 60 years old. And those women who are going through their supply much quicker may even go through the menopause at, uh, by the age of 40. Uh, the, the old term we use for, uh, for that is premature uh, yeah. uh, menopause. That, that's and that the again is why testing is important because it's you might be planning to have a family 39, 40, 41, <laughs> but if you know that there's a possibility you might go into early menopause, then it's good that, to... It, that's yeah. exactly the reason. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. But r very important to know that this, even if you go through your supply much quicker, it doesn't change the quality of your eggs. So even if you're a woman who's losing your eggs very rapidly and you're 32 years old and there's another lady and so your AMH may be lower and there's a, a, what, maybe one of your friends and she's going through her supply much slower and she has a very high AMH and she'll go through the menopause later. If you're both trying to get pregnant at the same time, the quality of your eggs, which is set by your age, is the same. Okay. Well. And, the very, and the important thing to know, it's, it only takes one egg and one sperm to make a baby. So that just because someone has a higher AMH does not mean they have a higher chance, no. Yeah. You have a, if you're the same age, your chance of getting pregnant, as long as you still have and eggs, the is exactly the That's same. That's really yeah. comforting. Because yeah. I think people get really worried, and especially like since I've started doing the testing, I've been getting my friends tested, and we all have different numbers. I'd be slightly on the, the lower side, but still I'm fine. But then I'm hearing like a lot of high numbers, and I'm like, God, so to know that 
that's not really what it's about. It's about the quality of the egg. Now, one of the questions we got asked a lot when we put up our Q&A box was, what is the optimum AMH level? But that depends on a lot of different factors, doesn't yeah, it? Yes, that is correct. It, um, uh, it depends on what age you are. Uh, also, uh, we, we're talking about um, uh, uh, um, getting pregnant uh, and we're ex uh, we kind of like um, forgetting that it takes two to make a baby. Mm -hmm. So it also depends on what's, uh, d does your partner have a normal sperm count as well? Yes. Okay, lots of women t put a lot of pressure on, on themselves, themselves yeah. but 40% uh, uh, of the time when we see couples who are having difficulty, it's actually this, the issue is with the, is with the male partner, not with the female. So, if you're a couple who've been trying for the twelve months, like you suggest, like you said, should they come in with their partner as well? Should both parties be tested from the get-go? Uh, uh, that's what we would would uh, would encourage and would okay. say that yeah, yes, both should come in because it's. Um, fertility is not an issue of one, it's an issue for the couple, if yeah. they're a couple trying to get pregnant. Yeah. We always blame ourselves for these things, it's crazy, <laughs> but we can, we can, it does take two to tango. Um, Mikey, before we go into the process of egg freezing, the options in Sims IVF provide to patients, there's so many different things you can go in and you can get checked and you can get done, but there's a lot of fertility myths surrounding the services, surrounding what we were talking about there, AMH. So I wanted to go through a few myths and I want you to debunk them for us. Um, so firstly, this is the most important thing, I think, because it's the most popular question we got. Does taking the pill in any way affect your fertility? No, and we would say no, you know. And um, there's so many girls, women out there that have been on the pill from when they've been in their early teens because of having issues with their menstrual cycle or pain with their menstrual cycle. We would say no, you know, obviously when you're going to start trying for a baby, you would stop the pill yeah. and within a few months your cycle should regulate. If it doesn't, that's the time to link in with your doctor, your fertility yeah. clinic. But yeah. people are genuinely terrified. I've been on the pill since I was 17, I've been on the pill since I was 20 and they're really concerned that they should maybe stop much younger in order to get pregnant in a couple of years time but really it doesn't affect it at all no and it's, again that's a life choice you know yeah. where are you in, in your life you know are you ready to stop the pill yeah. is it going to totally disrupt your life and really we're all in pursuit of our own happiness we have yeah. to look after ourselves and um, so you have to do what's right for so you so it's a fear that's really unfounded then absolutely and if i could add um actually many um uh, many of our protocols when we're treating women to try and get help them become pregnant in the IVF process, we actually sometimes use the pill to help schedule their, 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 their periods. So uh, people should not be worried about the pill affecting their fit. We actually use it yeah. as well to help us well, in our treatment in, in, in IVF. And another um, popular misconception that we came across as well is that people think you need to have sex every single day while you're trying. Men That's, think that. Yeah, well, men definitely think that. <laughs> yeah. But know you know, you see, it, you see it in movies and TV shows where, you know, where a couple are trying to get pregnant and it's like, right, the alarm every day, they're having sex all the time. But that's actually not the case. It's not uh, necessary. You, you don't necessarily have to do that. Uh, um, <laughs> although uh, I have to say, uh, in, in, um, the more you have sex, the more likely you are yeah. to get pregnant. Yeah. However, sperm can survive in the female genital tract for mm -hmm. three to five days. Yeah. And so as long as you're having sex about three to four times a week, yeah. um, uh, they will always be sperm there when, okay. whenever the woman ovulates. Okay. So you don't need to have sex every day because, yeah. sper as I said, sperm survives in the, in the genital tract yeah. for about three to five days. And so um, as long as two, th two, uh, three, uh, two to three times, four times a week is, more, is, appropriate, is appropriate. But the more um, uh, having it every day, there's no issue with that either. And another myth, <laughs> and again, I blame Hollywood for this one, um, is that you have to lie down after sex in order to conceive. Uh, definitely not. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure where, where, that, where that one came from. I think it's a good it's, excuse. It's yeah, it's a good excuse to lie down afterwards, but it actually medically doesn't make a difference. Does yeah, it? it doesn't make a difference because okay. sperm are ex sperm are microscopic, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, um, uh, where they uh, they survive, they, they is, uh, the 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 surface that the that they that the sperm get um, get um, uh, um, um, ejaculated onto. It it it's not like a smooth uh, uh, floor as we. It has it has tiny um, ridges and stuff where the sperm can actually swim swim along. So it, 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 uh, you getting up is not going to make, make it. It's gonna, uh, going to change uh, the is, direction that yes, they're going it's in. Yes, it's going to change the direction. It's going to be able um, to swim across. Another popular question. I'm interested to know the answer to this myself. Does exercise and diet can that affect fertility? I mean, can you be? Is it more likely you're going to get pregnant if you're eating well and you're exercising regularly? 
Uh, I'd say um, uh, it's it, moderation is, yeah. is, is the main thing here. Um, uh, too, too little, if you have a very sedate lifestyle and you're not doing any exercise, you're more likely to gain weight and you get, uh, end up with a, a raised BMI, which can sometimes affect uh, your, your, your cycles, your periods. And uh, so you don't want to be doing no exercise at all. Um, uh, a, s a moderate amount of exercise is good. But at the same time, right on the other, uh, at the other uh, end of the scale, over-exercising is not a very good thing. It can, um, uh, especially if you if you end up having a very low BMI, and that can affect um, uh, uh, affect your menstrual cycle as well and your ability to ovulate. We see this especially in elite athletes, you know, like uh, um, uh, marathon uh, female. Mm. I was just about to say, don't run a marathon every day then if you're trying to get <laughs> pregnant. So yeah, you see it there as well. Yeah, we see we see it in the elite athletes and uh, e even professional like uh, uh, female uh, football players okay. uh, who exercise a lot. It does affect their menstrual cycle. So balance basically so is the key. Ex exactly uh, balance and, and a healthy diet, of course, is is very very good uh, uh, cutting um, uh, not smoking um, uh, uh, cutting down on alcohol um, 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 uh, cutting down on the amount of caffeine you're drinking so they they, they uh, there is advice I'm not a professional nutritionist yeah but they um, moderation uh, is basically <laughs> moderation the is, the, is the key another here. question we got which is really interesting as well is there's a lot of anxiety surrounding the COVID-19 vaccine so when the vaccine first came about I'm sure Mikey you saw this as well there was a lot of worry, completely unfounded worry, that the vaccine was going to make women infertile. Have you come across that in the clinic? Were people worried? Absolutely. And with the way government guidelines have been moving and they're constantly changing, we that was one of the um, barriers we had yeah. within the clinic. And obviously our pro first port of line is to, to look after our patients and yeah. to give the correct advice. Yeah. So really what it came down to was we didn't advise, we said to everyone, yeah, you should absolutely go and get the vaccine. Yeah. The research out there did not say it was going to affect your fertility, yeah. the same as if you were pregnant, you should have the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and really that's what our patients have been mm -hmm. doing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just with the booster that's come out recently as well. You know, there are, if anyone here has had the vaccine, you probably did have a high temperature after it. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. always not and ideal. actually, a lot of women talked about their periods changing, which actually happened to me. I got my period early both times I got the vaccine. Now, personally, I wasn't worried. I didn't think the vaccine was going to make me infertile. I just thought my body was reacting to something that was quite big, that was, you know, getting into my system. That's how I saw it. But I saw other women online freaking out. My period changed. Does this mean that I'm becoming infertile? what's happening and absolutely and you can see that women's periods change for a lot of reasons yeah. long-haul flights yeah. stress yeah. arguments there's yeah. many reasons why your cycle can change yeah um, the vaccine obviously all of us you know some of us flew through it some of us felt horrible after yeah. it so you can imagine if you felt a bit off for a couple of days it can upset effect, your cycle yeah. but when it comes to fertility no there's no evidence yeah I was just gonna say that to you Dr Moses I mean from a medical perspective um, what what has been shown um, uh, is that when when we, when women had the first uh, um, uh, first jab uh, those who were taking the t the two the two um, the the vaccines that required two jabs it didn't really affect any uh, women's cycles when they had the first jab what was noticed is that when the women had this the second jab many, uh, quite a significant numbers uh, so anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of women noticed their their periods changing um, uh, uh, maybe they were longer or shorter. Uh, their uh, sorry, not periods, but their cy cycles. Yeah. Sometimes they felt they were heavier, um, and this may may have lasted two or three uh, three uh, menstrual cycles. But then after that, they went back to normal. Mm -hmm. And again, this was seen again when they had the booster shot. Yeah. It did. Um, yes, what we we noticed these menstrual changes. It di it it didn't affect their ability to become pregnant. Yes. It just altered uh, altered their cycle. We don't know whether it uh, it altered their ovulation during that cycle, yeah. but what we do know definitely is that after the, the second or third cycle, everything went, went back, back to, normal. to normal. And that's what, that's what happened to me. It went straight back to normal. So I think there was a lot of people just trying to worry people for no reason, you know? And it was scary because the vaccine was at such an early stage. And I just remember there was a lot of worries about it. And from the Q&A we did, there's still a few people maybe a little bit worried about the vaccine. But as far as you guys are concerned, there's no effect on fertility. No. Okay, that's really important. Um, okay, so we've debunked some good myths there, but we want to get into the process. So Mikey, tell me in the most basic terms, how does egg freezing work? And why is it an important thing to do for someone who is planning to have a family in the future? 
in the, so the, the process, so really you've made a decision now, you know, you're feeling empowered, you're like, right, you found your fertility clinic, Sims IVF, that's going to help you through the process. So really, um, you have a couple of consults with your doctor, um, then you have your investigations like you've had as well. And then really, once you're ready, so we would wait for your period to come. Um, so when you start to bleed, this is when you will start your medications. So in the days before that, you'll have picked up your medications from the pharmacy. One of our nurses will have educated you on how to use them. There are a couple of injections that we will counsel you through because obviously no one wants to inject themselves. Yeah. I'm so used to some diabetic, so it's a very yeah. easy situation for me. Yeah. But yeah, it can be very scary. Absolutely. The thought of and some people want their partners to do it. But we have to remember that some women do this journey Come on their by own. Themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And don't tell anyone. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, you know, you start your cycle, you come in for a scan. Um, another thing that can be quite scary for women is the scans are internal. It's not yes. a scan. I, on your I didn't tummy. know when I went in, yeah. I was, but it was actually totally fine. And obviously in the scan, um, we'll, we'll chat more in depth about it, but they're looking for the follicles to see how many Absolutely. eggs you might have. And I was so scared. And then I could just see them all on the screen. And it was the most comforting thing, yeah. just knowing they were there. So it actually wasn't scary at all. And that's it. That's what we do. We kind of hold your hand through the process and mind you, you know, because it, it, can, it can go one way or the other sometimes. And it's, you know, it's, it can be life changing as well. So really what we do is you have three or maybe four scans along that cycle. When you get to day 12 or sometimes day 14, that's when we go, OK, right, we're ready to collect the eggs now. So we give you a specific injection to take at a specific time. You come in two days later and you have your egg collection. Yeah. And the egg collection is done under what we'd say conscious sedation. So it's like if you were going into hospital for a day case, it's not full yeah. anesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, and your eggs are then collected. They go into the lab, they're examined under the microscope. And then the next day when you're home, you get a phone call from the lab to say how many they were able to freeze. That's amazing. And those eggs are frozen in time, whether you use them when you're 30 or 40, yeah. whenever they they don't age, they're frozen, yeah. that's I, it. I was going to talk to you about that, Dr. Moses. Obviously, I'm starting to freeze my eggs now, so I'm going through this. And one of the most important things to me is that if I choose to have children later time, the age of my eggs will still be my current age now, which is 32. So what are the first steps in freezing your eggs? So if someone's going in, they're doing the AMH testing, and they realize maybe the numbers aren't as high as they want them to be, would you suggest just freeze them if you're thinking of having a family? Or like, what, what's your suggestion, I suppose, for when do you know it's right to actually freeze your eggs? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, a so, loaded question, I know. Yeah, a lot, a I know. Lot of some people will just know, like I knew, but I definitely think there's some women who maybe are single and they really want to have children at a later date, but they're not really sure if they need to freeze their eggs. All right, so uh, firstly, um, and, and may, uh, maybe it's also another myth. People who freeze their eggs are not infertile yeah. or subfertile. Yeah. It doesn't mean you will have difficulty getting pregnant if you tr uh, if you met Mr. Right yeah. and uh, try to get uh, preg uh, pregnant with them. In fact, we have statistics that show um, only 30% of women who freeze their eggs ever require them in the future for treatment. Mm. 70% of women who freeze their eggs meet, uh, when they eventually try and get pregnant with, with, with a partner, get pregnant naturally. I thought you were going to say statistically when people get their eggs frozen, they meet Mr. Right. That's <laughs> I was like, I'm heading off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gone. That, that's really interesting though. So 30%. Yeah, only so it's 30%. basically an option B for a yes. lot of people. It's, it's an insurance policy. Yeah. And, and that's the way I, I normally describe it to women who come, who come for consultation. I, t um, I describe it like I've, ever since I was in my 20s, I've taken out home insurance, mm -hmm. you know, for burglaries or acts, and I've never actually required it. Exactly. Yeah. It's yes. an option B. Yeah. And this is the same thing. Uh, freezing your eggs is like an insurance policy you may need. Yeah. But we know that vast majority of people never use their home insurance policy. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing, vast majority of women never require to use their, uh, their frozen eggs because they're not, all we've done is just frozen your eggs. We, have, we, have, we, have, we haven't done any tests to show whether you're, you're going to have difficulty yes. conceiving naturally yeah. in the future. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first thing. And then um, another thing. Another thing I might is because again, a lot of our data is based on studies that were done about 15, 20 years ago. And 15, 20 years ago, we, we looked and saw you had a very good um, uh, chance of having a baby with your frozen eggs if you, ha if you had frozen between 10 
to 12 eggs. Yes, yeah. Okay, you had a very good, I'd say about a 90% possible. If you're under the age of 37 and you froze uh, uh, 10 to 12 eggs. However, this was based on old technology. Uh, we used to do, uh, do it, uh, uh, freeze our egg, uh, eggs in something called slow freezing. Uh, and the survival rate of eggs was only about 80% with that. Currently, we use something called rapid freezing or vitrification. And here, the survival rate of eggs is about 90, 95 to 98%. So, for example, if someone did an egg, egg collection and they had 10 eggs, the viability of those 10? It's about uh, 95 to 97% right. will survive. Yeah, because a lot of people think, and I actually thought this as well, so you're busting some myths for me, is that when you freeze your eggs, maybe only one of the eggs would successfully work. No. If you, with the old technology, if you froze 10 yeah. eggs, maybe eight would survive okay, okay. when you unfroze them. Right. But uh, currently, with the new technology, That's amazing. it's almost uh, if, uh, 95, I mean, it's almost uh, 10 out of 10 or yeah. 9 out of 10 would survive. So what age would you suggest starting this journey? Because there might be women in their late 20s that maybe they're very busy with their career or they're single and they know they don't want children yet, but they're getting a bit nervous about the egg quality reducing or the egg quantity reducing. What age would you suggest to investigate this? Again, uh, one thing which I'd say is that there's the general and then there's the specific. In general, if you were to ask me when should you investigate your, your ovarian reserve or, uh, or think about egg freezing, in general, I'd first say anywhere between 30 to 37 years old. Mm -hmm. that, that's in general. Yeah. Now, if you're 26 years old, and one thing which is very important is a lot of time, ovarian reserve, it runs along the female line of a family. Mm. Yeah. Now, if you know that your mom went into the uh, menopause when she was uh, uh, 40. Yes. Or, or, or in her late 30s. There is, a, there is quite a good chance that you may be following the same uh, trajectory. Yeah. Okay. So if, if, you, if, you, um, if you found out from, if your mom mentioned, oh, by the way, I went into the, in, into the menopause when I was, in, when I was uh, 39, or th then it's, uh, if you're in your 20s, it is, it is a very good idea to check your yeah. AMH and maybe um, uh, freeze your eggs when you're, when you're younger. Yeah. However, if, you're, uh, if you have regular, si or, and also if you're a woman who has very irregular periods, you know, sometimes they're long, sometimes they're short. Sometimes that could be a, a, a warning that, uh, that, that yeah. there's something wrong with your ovarian reserve. Yeah. Uh, go and see your doctor, have things checked when you're younger. However, if your mother says, oh yeah, I went into the change when I was in my mid-50s and you have a regular cycle, I'd say there's no need to panic. Wait until you're between your 30s and 30s, if, you haven't, if you're not actively trying with your partner and then have things checked then. And then another question we got that was quite popular as well, these are obviously women who have gone for the AMH test but maybe haven't gone further, was can you still freeze your eggs if your AMH levels are quite low? Yes, you can. And, um, and again, uh, um, it, it's all depends, or it's what is the clinical scenario there. Uh, if it's low and you're 25, the quality, uh, or 28, the, um, your quality is, uh, is very good. Almost 70, 80% of your eggs are good quality and would result in a child being born. So even if you are um, collecting one or two eggs from a 28, 29 year old lady, there is a very good chance that is enough for her yeah. to have a child mm -hmm. because of her age. Yeah. If you're so don't let the numbers alarm you too much. Then. Exactly. Okay. Don't let, let us, it's a really important that you speak to your doctor. Yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, the, the, they get all the all the all the facts together, and then you can make a, a, a decision. As Mike said, knowledge is yes. power. Um, before we go further into egg freezing, I want to chat to and Holly and sorry, Pauline. I, yeah, I was just going to say one other thing. And egg freezing doesn't mean you only have one shot at it, because hmm. even if let's say you 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 have a very low ovarian reserve, it doesn't mean that oh yeah, if we collect one or two eggs for so, some women who let's say they are, 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 are at an older age and we need more eggs. We can do several egg freezing cycles in a, a year or over a number of years, yeah. and that will help you then accumulate get a, a good number, a, a, a larger number. So there are solutions. Yeah. Don't don't get. Uh, I I don't I don't want anyone to get disheartened and think, mm. oh, I have a low number, 
th that's me. And then done. they just no. leave it. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. can We do have solutions where we can end up collecting over a, over a period of time so that you can get that bunch of eggs that w would would that's give you a amazing. good chance of having a child. We will go into the process more, but I want to chat to Thali, Thalia and Holly now. Um, so Holly, you got your AMH test recently, yeah. and you got your results. How did you find the experience? Like, were you very nervous about it? How did um, you feel? I think it was the whole concept was very new to me, even though I have just turned 30 um, last year. So I'm not 31 yet, though, so I'm still 30. <laughs> um, but I was obviously more conscious about my overall health and my all of that as you get older. But so I was a bit nervous going into it, not so much for the results in a way. I'm not great with needles. So I just even just fe being in that environment, I get really, you know, everyone's different with that. So the nurse was lovely. I just she was like, if you don't want to look, I won't even tell you and I'm going to do it. And I was there like and it was over before so I even had panicked. And ha had you thought about your fertility before this point? Genuinely, had it been something on well, your mind? I find it bizarre that we don't learn more about this in school because I think if I'd been if I had learned as much in school as I had in the last five minutes, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't have worried as much. I know, know what I always think is so funny when you're in school, it's like don't have sex, you're gonna get pregnant. Yeah, and then when you're older, pad. it's like it's actually quite complicated to get yeah, pregnant. I know. So we grow up, especially in Catholic Ireland, in a very different understanding of what sex is, what yeah. menstruation is. Like you said, the last five minutes we probably all learned I know. so much more. So exactly. For you, has this been a bit of an eye opener then? Definitely. I mean, I remember we all thought there was a girl who got pregnant from going down a water slide. Yeah. <laughs> that a sperm just like jumped into Holly's her top. busting some myths yeah. as well here. <gasps> it's actually crazy. And that fear stays I inside know. for so a long it's time. Just, I think like, so I was nervous, but actually just looking it up, being on the website, it gave me that sense of clarity. And even no matter what my results had been, knowing that I had kind of just done something for myself and taken the power in my own hands and just gone, look, whatever the results may be, I'm here to just find out. And also they've seen every result in the book in the clinic. So no matter what you come out with, you know that you're in good hands. Yeah. So I didn't feel too panicked in that sense, but And yeah. actually, as Dr. Moes has said, even if the result maybe wouldn't have been what you wanted, there's ways and means to have yeah, a family. Exactly, yeah. Um, and obviously, so you're 30 now, you're in a long-term relationship. One of the things I want to talk about today, I suppose, is the pressure that's on women to have children. And this is why I think egg freezing is very important because we mightn't want to have kids till we're 40. It's totally up to us. But yeah. do you feel there's societal pressure around that? I do think that it's a really Irish thing that people think you can just ask someone, yeah. you know, day two of their wedding. So when are you going to have kids? Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, I know it's a calm and day. And they know some, that person might actually yeah, have Yeah, exactly. Problems. And I think as well with social media, you get to a certain age, people are waiting for the engagement announcement, the wedding, then the baby, then whatever. So it can feel like a lot of pressure, but hopefully I feel like there has been a bit of a shift with more awareness around the fact that it's not that easy all the time. Yeah. I think more people have shared their IVF journey. They've shared that they're struggling with fertility. They've shared that they might be adopting. So through social media, I think people have kind of learned that you can't just ask the question because there's so many different ways it could be going for someone. Yeah. Um, but aside from all that I do still feel like it was more when I turned 30 yeah. that suddenly like I'm going to a christening later and I'm like, ah, <laughs> like oh my babies God, everywhere babies. yeah so would you do you think that 30 is, is a good kind of age then to start investing in this yeah as well? I yeah. think so I mean I think it's probably everyone's going to be completely different for me it felt like the right age and yeah I'm really glad I did it yeah Talia same question to you I suppose you're also in a long-term relationship is this a question that gets asked do you feel pressure surrounding it uh, I, I think I do um probably in a different vein to Holly. Because of my job, you know, people don't ask because they assume as a model, I can't get pregnant because I'd lose the shape of the body and it would just throw my career out of whack. Which, which is a I whole other is, level of pressure. Yeah, yeah, which is a whole other level of pressure. And we've seen how many models come back from that. But anyway, that's a different conversation. Um, I definitely do still feel it though. You know, I've been in a five year relationship, um, but I've had concerns about fertility for a very long time. So it was very interesting when you mentioned Dr. Moses about the lineage and the kind of bloodline between mother and daughter. So my mom was deemed infertile um, and she had to undergo surgery. She had two kids and then nine years later, she fell pregnant with me at 42. So she so was a miracle baby. I'm a miracle baby. Yeah. My name is Talia Angel. <laughs> okay. I'm a miracle baby. There's yeah. all of these terms thrown around. Yeah. So they're the nicer end of the terms, but then you've yes. got geriatric pregnancy um, and you know, she then fell into her menopause afterwards. And there was, it was just, I remember speaking about my conception and, you know, the whole process. And it was just quite a negative, the, the terminology, the medical terminology. And then obviously my mum's own experience was just quite negative and scary. And so I've always had a fear of my own fertility and, and um, what my journey might look like. And my sister thankfully had no issues when she had children. 
But before the lockdown, I had booked in, so I was 24, to get a fertility test because it was something I was concerned about. And then the pandemic hit and I didn't um, follow through with that. So I just feel really comforted in this panel and talking about these things and knowing that even if there is an issue with my family line, I ne might necessarily face those issues and there's also options for me and like you said there's specialized treatments for people and you don't have to necessarily just assume the you're worst. infertile or you're yeah. barren or all these words and the fact that you even brought up Moses about the um, infertility not being used anymore I just think infertility is such a negative term it's it, it conjures up such um just confusing emotions I think yeah. for women and for men and your mom had been given that term which doesn't yeah. even exist now. exactly and yeah. it's I think even to be able to tell her after this you know yeah. that they don't use that anymore so and comforting. even women in her position don't have to go through what she went through yeah. which I think is really important and I think you mentioned like the the Catholic Church response that yes. we all have yeah. as women and men in Ireland of you know oh the christening you know oh there's babies there's baby talk around your boyfriend your friends yeah and i love that we can take it into our own hands and women can take it into their own hands and gay couples can take it into yeah. their own hands and it's just a i feel very comforted on this panel and when i i'm sitting on this panel not as someone who's hoping to necessarily freeze my eggs just yeah. yet now that i know that the options are quite simple yeah. and there's loads of ways to do it i will definitely consider it but i i opened up the question box on my own instagram um because I wanted to come on and, and learn, which was my main goal, and to also ask the questions that women similar to me would have. Yeah. And I just feel like they've all been answered, most of them. I hope they have, yeah, anyway. That's um, amazing. Yeah, I just feel really comforted, and I hope people watching and listening feel the same. Yeah. It is a really nice thing to be a part of, and I just feel like it's definitely a softer, nicer thing Not than scary. we assume it to yeah. be because it's so taboo to talk about infertility these and days. And I definitely think it's important to say that you know a lot of women feel like they have to wait for Mr. Right that you know their chance to have children is when they meet the right guy but it's mm -hmm. important that there's so many other options and that's I'm going to talk to the guys about this now as well but to Holly and Thalia is that something you've ever I suppose considered before maybe alternative options to having a family if you weren't in a relationship at the time that you wanted yeah. to have children? Well I've always thought that I've kind of, to be honest, been laid back about it in my mind. I never really put any pressure on myself, but I've known people who have felt that by, you know, 25, they wanted to meet him, 27, they wanted the ring, 28, they wanted the wedding. The and if they don't reach, if they're 28 and they haven't met him, it's like this map that they've created is all going backwards. Yeah. And, you know, hyperventilating coming up to their 30th if they're still single. And it's like, I just think that's the worst thing you can do for yourself. So I think like for me, I don't know, I've, I've kind of always known in a sense that you know, you see it in movies, you hear about it, but maybe that's easy for me to say because I was never yeah. had this urge to be yeah. overly maternal and I didn't yeah. have my baby names picked and I didn't know yeah. how many kids I wanted. But I do feel for women who go, I want three kids, I want them by this age. So I think that when you put that pressure on yourself, it probably is harder to imagine going alone. Yeah. But because I've never really put that amount of pressure, I think I've always known that in a sense, the option is have. there. Yeah, but yeah. also I've kind of found a, a strange reaction from people too when I've said that I wasn't sure if I was going to have kids. Do you know what I mean? It's like, what do you mean you don't know if you want kids? In Ireland, like it's yeah. it's We're it's like have, you're yeah. going to have the wedding and the baby. What are you talking yeah. about? So when you kind of give that, I don't know, it's a bit like <laughs> people were a bit freaked out by that. Which makes it almost worse for women who maybe want to go down the alternative because if you're getting the pressure yeah. of why haven't you met the guy why aren't you having the baby exactly what re reaction are you going to get if you're like I'm actually going to do it on my own I can't imagine I'd say it's very and it probably puts a lot of awkwardness and tension on friendships yeah. family relationships because I can imagine for generations like if you were to say it to your granny or someone yeah they, would they wouldn't be, understand they would not understand I remember it. the term just talking about old terms test you baby I yeah. heard that one and a lot there was a bit of shame around and it there was a lot of shame mm. uncertainty I mean it's all changed now which is amazing um, so I want to go back to Mikey and Dr. Moses about this as well. Um, if someone is single and they're going to get their eggs frozen, what are the options if they don't meet Mr. Right? If that's just not isn't what happens to them, they freeze their eggs, they come back five years later and they're like, look guys, I haven't met someone, but I really want to have kids. What, what's the next step there? Well, this is there's, there's so many options really. Um, and I've seen this change over the years. We used to look after women that would be in that situation and the f different phrases have been coined over the years. It yeah. used to be reproductive choice, which I loved. Um, now the word or the phrase solo female has come true. I like or that else there's idea. another one out there on social media, single mums by choice, which okay. is brilliant as well. There's definitely a hashtag in front of that, that one. I love so, that. Yeah. Um, 
I love it too. I love yeah. looking after these women as well because they're so empowered. They're mm -hmm. so strong. Nine times out of 10, they have really good support around them. And they've made that decision. They want to be a mum and they're going to go it alone. Well, with their support of their friends and family. Yeah. But really, yeah, we so you have your eggs frozen maybe 10 years before you come back. You're 35, 36, 37, depending on your most up to date investigations. You could start with IUI, which is where you would decide on what donor sperm you want to use. Yes. Which, you know, we've partnered with a company called Cryos, which is really we give you access to a website and like that you look at a catalog of sperm That's amazing. you look it's like <laughs> you know I, I, ah, well you just took the words right out of my mouth because yeah. earlier on i was like it's like the argus catalog yeah. of sperm yeah. and like we have looked after so many women where they have donor sperm selection parties with their pals <laughs> so like oh, you guys oh, yeah I you know open. i was never on tinder maybe this will be my only and this, my this is what i love about sims ivf in general is that you celebrate these things because like yeah. Holly you were saying earlier on about christenings weddings it's very hard to think how can I celebrate this but I love the idea that yeah. there's a party like everyone's going through the catalogue picking the guy and That's it amazing. is and it's like that fertility journey and fertility journeys can be short or they yeah. can be long yeah. you know but yeah. they're individualized yeah. and that's the most important thing so like our solo females that come through now, they, you know, they just select their donor sperm. You know, we send the order off and um, our donor sperm comes from Denmark. Okay. And um, yeah, once that arrives, treatment starts, you know, yeah. and because you've frozen your eggs already, it's just a case of the eggs are thawed, they're yeah. combined with the sperm and um, the embryos are made. And, you know, then you have your treatment. And um, yeah. the same as our solo females that come through that haven't had their eggs frozen, yeah. they can still have treatment with donor sperm and there's different options, whether it be IUI, where yeah. we inject the sperm in at a time in your cycle, yeah. or whether you can have IVF with donor sperm. That's amazing. And Dr. Moses, I suppose, percentage wise, what is the numbers when it comes to, I suppose, how many times does it work? Like, do you have to implant your eggs a few times? What's the realities there? So if someone comes back 10 years later, should they be expecting it's all going to be fine straight away? Can it be a, a process? Um, it really, uh, again, uh, it's a context. What yeah. age are you? Okay. Yeah. Now, if you're froze, if we're using frozen eggs mm -hmm. and you froze them when you were in your early 30s, yeah. success rate is very high. Amazing. I'd say it's... Uh, the ch um, uh, if you're going to have one embryo transferred yes. from eggs that were frozen when you're under the age of 35, odds are you're going to become pregnant on the first go. Amazing. I'd say it's about 55 to 60 percent wow. if you're under 35. Yeah. Now, if you're between 35 and 37, it's still about 45 percent. As in the age of the eggs? Uh, or the age yes, of the woman. age of the eggs. Sorry, yeah, thanks for yeah. Uh, um, uh, if you froze your eggs between the ages of 35 to um, to 37, it's about um, a 45 percent chance. Still quite high. Between 38 to 40, it's yeah. about 30 percent. Okay. And what happens if you freeze your eggs at 32, you come back at 42, and there's issues in terms of your own ovaries, and you actually maybe wouldn't be able to carry a pregnancy? Are there options to use the eggs? For surrogacy because i know this is a kind of weird topic in ireland where we're kind of unsure about that okay so firstly um, um rarely would it be if there's a problem with your ovaries your uterus would still be fine to okay. carry the pregnancy mm -hmm. uh if you're frozen your eggs in your in your 30s you're going to have a very high early 30s you're going to have a very high chance of of um of carry uh, of uh, getting pregnant even if you're in, even 45, uh, 45 years or even older, yeah. there wouldn't be an issue. Now you've spoken about surrogacy, and that's really when we, uh, when there's a, um, I'd say when there's a medically speaking, yeah. uh, because uh, 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 when it comes to to uh, uh, to uh, Ireland and the UK where I originally used to work, uh, surrogacy is only there for medical reasons. Yes. Yeah. For example, a if let's say if, um, you had a hysterectomy because. Mm. Um, you which could happen in the space of 10 years. That's why I'm yeah, interested which could, which could to happen. see what would happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or if you have other medical reasons, which mean that it's too dangerous for you to carry a pregnancy. Yes, yeah. Some women have developed heart conditions, mm -hmm. which means should they become pregnant, that heart condition could get worse. Yeah. Others have aneurysms in their, uh, which have been picked up in their brains, which mm -hmm. is a swollen blood vessel, which again may make carrying uh, a, 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 a pregnancy dangerous. So for those reasons, surrogacy could be indicated uh, whereby uh, we get uh, 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 we, uh, we create a, an embryo 
and it's transferred into another uh, to another lady who is able to carry that pregnancy yeah. for you. Now, as you've already mentioned, surrogacy is still controversial in yeah. in Ireland. There is no law uh, uh, that governs the practice of surrogacy, and because there's no law, we can't. We are a licensed clinic. We can only carry out. Um, what you're procedures, able to do. Yeah. Uh, which are licensed by the uh, organization called the HPRA, which is a government body that tells us what we can and yes. can't do. And Dr. Moses, obviously we've touched on the egg freezing process now, but let's get into the nitty gritty a little bit. Um, Mikey mentioned earlier that you have to take injections. Can you talk me through what the actual process is like? Okay. Uh, so for egg freezing, again, um, uh, I'll say what is, is in general. Sometimes it, it's different depending on, on, on clinical scenario. But the most, common, uh, the most common what we call protocol that women follow when they're having uh, egg freezing is something we call the short protocol. Okay? And typically what happens is initially a, uh, a woman may be given the contraceptive pill to take from the start of her period for anything between 10 to 14 days. When she stops taking the pill, should uh, um, uh, about three to four days later, she has another, uh, another artificial period. And we scan her, and we're scanning her to make sure that everything is quiet with her ovaries, there are no cysts, there are no, uh, the, the lining of her womb is thin, there are no polyps or anything that's going to hamper our, our, our treatment. And then once that's, or once that's checked and everything is okay, she can then start her, uh, taking her injections. And typically she takes one injection a day in the evening over a period of about 10 to 12 days. So it's just one injection in the evening. And the, the injection that they use is very similar to the uh, insulin injection that diabetics use. That I take, okay. yeah. <laughs> and uh, most women are able to, to, uh, to inject themselves uh, in, either in their tummy or in the side, on the side of their thigh. And um, we scan them at, uh, at intervals of uh, one at, well, when she first has the peri uh, that artificial period, then six days later, and then from six days, it's every two days. So day six, day eight, day 10. And what we're, we're scanning is we're seeing how the follicles are growing. Because uh, normally with a woman's cycle, she releases one egg. But these inject what we're trying to do with these injections is to get more than one egg to grow. We want to get- to kind of boost your follicles, basically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Uh, and we want to get something like anything between eight to 16 eggs to grow in that one cycle. And we scan you throughout uh, uh, over those, uh, those 10 to 12 days. And when the follicles reach, reach the, uh, the, what is a, the ideal size, we then give you a trigger injection. And when you have the trigger injection, that's when you stop taking the medication. And then we bring you back two days later, take you to theater. And, and as my, uh, Mikey said earlier, it's sedation. Yeah. I, I like to uh, describe sedation. It's a, it's a bit like I've had too many Proseccos to okay. drink. Okay. It, <laughs> often, it often happens. It often, so you're just relaxed a little yes. bit more yeah. than usual. Yeah, basically. you're breathing on your own. Uh, yeah. We're monitoring you. We yeah. take you into theater. Uh, the monitoring scans are in, internal scans, as, yeah. uh, as we've mentioned before. And when, when you're in theater, we again do an internal scan and we pass a needle into each ovary. And that needle is connected to a suction, and yeah. it's able to um, uh, to aspirate all the eggs from from yeah. uh, that, that that have grown in the yeah. follicles, and we're able to check actually that very same day uh, we hand over all the fluid we collect from each yes. follicle to the embryologists, and they're able to count the number of eggs that so are there. Yeah. So uh, in, in most cases, beef, um, and this pro the, the actual. Um, uh, procedure in theatre lasts anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes mm -hmm. okay. and you come around quite quickly we um, um, uh, we give you a cup of tea afterwards and a Prosecco <laughs> <laughs> no Prosecco <laughs> <laughs> and uh, e um, maybe within an hour that the the, uh, the the embryologist is able to tell you how many eggs they have collected right. okay. and even maybe uh, within two hours how many they're going to be capable of freezing yeah. so odds are sometimes before you even leave the you clinic know you know how many eggs have been frozen. And talk me through the actual injections, because I think people are worried about how it's going to affect them. And I know it affects everybody quite differently, but should someone expect mood swings, feeling sick? Is this something that can happen? Okay. Uh, now, uh, what I'd say is that, lo um, uh, again, historically, what I've just described is something, a, a, a new type of, 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 of stimulation. It's called the short protocol, mm -hmm. or in, in, in scientific terms, we call it the antagonist protocol. Okay. Traditionally, we used to have what was called the long protocol. We still use it in certain circumstances, especially in women who have either endometriosis 
or women who have fibroids. And with, but this is, it's very much the minority protocol now. It used to be the dominant one, but it's okay. very much the minority now. It may be used in maybe five to 10% of cases. And in that protocol, very different. On day 21 of a woman's cycle, if she has a typical 28 day cycle, she's given an injection that puts her into a temporary menopause. Oh, wow. And with that injection, about 40 to 50% of women have all the menopausal symptoms, mm. the hot sweats, the, yeah. um, the mood swings. This is the process swings. I would have heard of before I actually came to yeah. Sims. Yes. I thought that's what the process would be. Yeah. Yeah, but as I said, that is very much the um, uh, the uh, the old tradition. We call it the old conventional okay. protocol, which is c going out of vogue, especially yeah. because of the of the side effects that women ob observe. It is still used, as I said, in a minority because it has an advantage. It helps shrink fibroids. Uh, yeah. uh, if if women have large fibroids, which may prevent us being able to access the ovaries okay. and the follicles, or if she has endometriosis, which can have uh, inflammatory and a negative effect on the quality of the eggs we collect mm -hmm. we do use that protocol okay. but as I said that's very much a minority protocol as compared to the short protocol in which most women especially if we're using low doses to stimulate yeah. they hardly get any symptoms okay. whatsoever that's great because I know some women might be like I want to do it but I've this on this month where I'm working on that and they're scared that it's going to affect them mentally like when they feel sick what I'd say is with the short protocol especially we have lots of women who actually are uh, d doing their everyday job okay. um, lots of teachers lawyers yeah. um, uh, 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 women who are actually work and they yeah. we actually try and fit their treatment around right, their work schedule wow, okay. and they're able to continue through they're work perfectly fine. have the, the only time when they actually have to take any time of, is that the day of the egg collection and maybe of the course. day after yeah. to wow. just recover another but, myth debunked yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's so hard because I think we all get such misinformation or we rely on movies and it's so dramatic in films you know um, Mikey one of my favourite uh, packages that Sims offer is an amazing package for same-sex couples tell us about that yeah so um for our same-sex couples so lesbian couples coming through and um, we have what's called a shared motherhood package which is where female a would have her eggs collected and female b would then have the embryo that the, is created from those eggs implanted back to her so both Amazing. parts of the couple will um, have a link say to the baby yeah, that's created. Yeah, they both created. get to experience the pregnancy basically together. Exactly, then. they yeah. share it and you know the the technical term is reciprocal IVF um, but we had coined the phrase shared motherhood and I think it's really appropriate. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing and have you both I suppose seen an increase during the pandemic because I feel like a lot of people stopped what they were doing in their very busy schedules. Have you seen women maybe come in and be like right I actually think I need to look mm. at this I hadn't thought about it before? For sure. Um, definitely from the start of the pandemic, yeah. uh, all of our clinics, they exploded. So busy. A big part of that was people couldn't travel. Um, yes. So in years gone by, people maybe went to America or Eastern Europe. Um, but really, it gave people time to think. Yeah. People couldn't spend their money on holidays, etc., yeah. uh, etc. Et or maybe relationships broke down in the pandemic. Mm. Um, so really, you know, there was some, I've met some women that have come true that or with a partner for 10 years and then they were at home together for a year working from home and yeah. their relationship broke down right. yeah. and now that female is in with us having her eggs frozen what just a two years it's been for everybody my exactly God. Yeah. Really interesting isn't it because we think of the pandemic boom of babies yeah. and i'm i'm really interested and a couple of people asked me i hope you don't mind ali um a lot of people fell pregnant do you think that was stress related that stress was removed from their lives to a certain degree and they were at home yeah. maybe there was more sex being had there was more time i wonder was that do you think that was a thing so a lot of people asked me about endometriosis which was really interesting that you've already brought it up dr moses but um the pregnancy and stress, stress and even when you said about the egg retrieval and the egg freezing how 70 percent of the time people then fall pregnant naturally i wonder is there a stress related to maybe what i had of this fear of infertility yeah. And when you're kind of given that calming advice from the experts yeah. and they tell you that there's other options, do you find people then often get pregnant naturally, like you said earlier, because there's kind of that fear removal and that association of, God forbid, you're, for, you're infertile removed? Well, I think in the pandemic, it made us all stop and yes. think yeah. um, and reevaluate what we're at, mm. what makes us happy. Um, and I think we're all happiest when we're at home. Yeah. So the pandemic yeah. forced us to be at <laughs> yeah. home yeah. Yeah. with our loved ones. 
So, you know, the happy hormone is oxytocin. So mix in the love of your life yeah. and you're at home with no pressures, Thank external you. pressures. Mm -hmm. Of course, pregnancies can happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, yeah, I do think there was an impact there. And my colleagues in maternity hospitals in Dublin will say, yeah, wilder than ever. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think the important thing was, yeah, I think we just all stopped, yeah. had a look at what we were doing, what's affecting us, what are all our and triggers. That's, that's a really important question yeah. Tanya just brought up there. Do you think that stress can actually affect the level of fertility in women? For sure. I think mm. it's hilarious. You know, I say to heterosexual couples, our same sex couples coming through, it's really important you don't get stressed. Like yeah. take time off work like and, and they're like, yeah. are you joking me? Like I have to take these <laughs> yeah, injections. Yeah. You're putting that probe inside yeah, me. Yeah. You know, yeah. the pressure, am I going to get five eggs, 10 eggs, three yeah. embryos? Like mm, how yeah. can I not be stressed? So that's where all the alternative mm, kind of complement true. therapies yeah. come in. Acupuncture, reflexology, mm. laughing, yeah. sharing your worries. Yeah. We have counsellors with Sims IVF that are absolutely beautiful. Oh, that brilliant. really, okay. and then our nurses and our doctors. Yeah. Like, I hope you can see yes. we're nice people, yeah. you know, and like we will mind you. Hands. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very, very, that's it, yeah. and it very is. Good. You know, um, like I've got a husband and I've got a one year old and three year old and that's oh, against yeah. the odds, but it's only through the mm -hmm. world of fertility yeah, and fertility amazing. medicine. So. And I think that's the biggest thing about today is understanding your choices are not limited. There's yes. actually so many options, whether you're single or you're in a same sex relationship, things that maybe before were barriers, they're really not anymore. So we're on to the last question, guys. So Thalia and Holly first, um, what have you learned today? What's the, your biggest takeaway? As Everything. Um, <laughs> I've learned that what we were taught is not what is real life. Yeah, um, yeah. I've learned that science has come a hugely long way since my mum got pregnant with me and I definitely didn't necessarily need to feel the fear I had. But I'm also glad I felt that because I've come in probably a bit more sceptical yeah. than I've left. So yeah. um, I think just the fact that I, I've met both of you I would be much more comfortable coming into a clinic, yeah. telling you my story, my fears, and knowing the process isn't as scary as necessarily my mom had to go through yeah. when she had the same issues. Um, so yeah, I, I just hope that anyone watching this knows this is a safe environment and a yeah. safe space and you're changing the narrative, which yeah. I think is really important for people to realize that you don't have to be a woman like Holly said, fearing her 30s without yeah. a couple, you know, without yeah. a relationship or a home or the infrastructure in place to have a family. Yeah. And there are alternative methods and there are specialized treatments for people. I, I just, I'm very comforted by this yeah. and I hope that that's translated in the piece. I suppose, well, everything Talia said and put it yeah. so well. And also just that I have done the AMH now and I've received my results. I actually didn't realize that I was carrying a bit of a, a worry. Yeah. And so the relief I felt when I saw my results and I saw heard more about my options, I actually sometimes don't think you realize that maybe you are worrying about something or yeah, you're brushing it off. And I'm a real like, you know, don't think Under about the it. Rug. Under the rug. Under <laughs> the rug, I'll deal with that. The rug's up to here. Yeah, the rug's like, <laughs> okay. So actually just to feel that sense of relief and yeah. to hear all these other stories of success and to hear how many, you know, lives have been changed through yeah, the different kind of options so, so it is really kind of uplifting and really yeah. hopeful conversation and i definitely think we can all agree to so many terms that can be thrown out the window mm -hmm. like old school terms um mikey then for you i suppose what advice would you give to anybody watching who's maybe about to start this journey and is very nervous even about coming in for the very first consultation i'd say don't be afraid um we're going to mind you we're going to hold your hand and we're going to educate you and to get back to my phrase is always knowledge is power yeah um and we love our jobs in sims ivf and yeah. you know we love empowering women empowering men empowering couples and and creating babies and creating families yeah. so we will do everything we can to get where, get you where you want to be yeah. and it yeah. like i'm one of those people I need to have a plan B and I need yeah. to have a plan C. Yeah. And that's what we'll do. Okay. We will right. do it. We are the experts. We'll mind you. And like that, these things, these forms are so important because yeah, talking, talk talking, talking, it. it's so important. And yeah, so yeah, go for it, you know, Same come into to us. Dr. Moses, if anyone's watching and they're a little bit nervous, what advice would you have? Uh, yeah, I can't agree anymore that, uh, with Mikey. It's don't be nervous, come in, they ask. They, there's always an option. Yeah. There is always an option. And that's what many people think. They, they, they'll they get some bad news and it will mean that, uh, uh, and they feel like their world is going to come crashing yeah. down. Yeah. But actually, they are, 
whenever uh, patients come in, they find they actually walk out empowered because they get information. Even if there is bad news, they they are solutions uh, available. Yeah. And so do come in. Don't uh, just take that first step of com of coming through the front door. There's there's a, a a large team of doctors, nurses, embryologists, and we're all we're there for you. We're there to make sure we provide you the options which are which will be ideal for your particular situation. Well, thank you so much to Dr. Moses, Thalia, Mikey and Holly. All the treatments and all the testing we discussed today is all available in Sims IVF. You can take a look yourself on sims.ie where you can schedule an appointment with a fertility specialist. And just remember that Sims IVF have clinics nationwide and they've helped thousands of people become parents since it was first established in 1997. And I'm sure you can tell after watching today that your hand will be held it's a very calming experience if you're nervous there are options so as mikey said earlier i'm with him on this knowledge is power thanks so much for watching